Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday event uh, lecture uh, or seminar uh, by Professor Ailey Marie Tripp. Really welcome to have you here. And uh, she is, um, I'm just going to give a short bio and let her speak because her topic is very exciting, which is around um, women's rights, adoption of women's rights um, discourse in, um, in the, in, you know, in some parts of the Arab world, but with a focus on North Africa, if I'm not um, wrong. So, um, Ailey, uh, Professor Tripp has a long and il illustrious career. She is the Wangari Mathi Professor of Political Science and Gender and Women's Studies at Wisconsin Madison University. Uh, she works and she researches women and politics in Africa, women's movements in Africa, African politics, and also the informal economy uh, in Africa. And she has published widely and, she, and, and her work is uh, award-winning work. Uh, but her major uh, publications are books, uh, Women and Politics in Uganda, Museveni's Uganda, Paradoxes of Power uh, in, hybrid, uh, in a Hybrid Regime, and Women and Power in Post-Conflict Africa. But today she's going to talk to us uh, more in relation to the Middle East and North Africa and the question of women's rights. And she will be giving a presentation. And if I may ask for you to put your, for all the participants to put their uh, questions in the question and answer, and then I will pose them to Ailey. Um, so this is uh, the, the fifth lecture in term two of a series of lectures and uh, seminars that we hold uh, and uh, is hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute. And I uh, co-chair it with my colleague, uh, Nargis Farzad, who is the chair of the Center for Palestine, uh, sorry, chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. And I am the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies. And my name is Dina Matar, and I also work at SOAS. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us and looking forward to this exciting presentation. Welcome, Ailey. Thank you very much. I'm just going to get this going here. Let's make sure I have it. Have it uh... Here we go. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to you in, in London. <laughs> Wish I could be there, but uh, um, another time, I hope. Uh, I've heard from other people who've spoken at your seminar that it's a wonderful place to present because you get such excellent feedback. So I'm very much looking forward to your your input. So today I'm talking about uh, a book that I just completed um, uh, recently um, called Seeking Legitimacy, Why Arab Autocracies Adopt Women's Rights. And one of the overarching questions that I've been asking um, in my work in Africa, North and South and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, is why are some countries more keen to adopt women's rights and, lo and women's laws and policies, women's rights laws and policies um, than other countries. And in this book, I'm asking the same question um, uh, because women's rights are generally associated much more with democracies. Um, and yet we have reforms taking place in autocratic countries as well. So I'm asking in particular, why do we see divergent trends between the Maghreb countries? And by here, I'm referring to uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia in this talk, although sometimes people include also Libya and Mauritania, but for this book, I'm looking at these three countries, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. And so I'm say, asking, why do we see divergent trends between these three countries and the Middle East when it comes to women's rights? Uh, and uh, of course, it's not like there's nothing, I mean, obviously there's, there are plenty, there's plenty happening in the Middle East and there are many reforms taking place. And we just saw the United Arab Emirates has, has increased the representation of women in their um, federal national council and their legislative body by up to 50%, um, which is a big jump from the previous 22%. So you see, you know, you're seeing reforms taking place elsewhere. Um, but in general, I am arguing that there's quite a big difference between these groups um, of countries. When I talk about, just, just to define a few uh, terms here, uh, uh, when I talk about, um, let's see, when I talk about um, 
women's rights, I'm talking about, um, or I'm talking about them as how they're defined by women's movements within these countries. So that's my reference point. And I'm drawing on two original uh, databases, um, one on women's, uh, women's rights and constitutions in the MENA region um, from 1950 to 2018. And then also I draw on interviews that I did um, between 2015 and 2017 in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Um, and I did these with leaders of various um, variety of organizations, Islamists, feminists, Amazir, um, human rights groups, members of parliament, leaders of women's legislative caucuses, um, party leaders, uh, religious leaders, lawyers, and so on, journalists. Um, and so um, very quickly, just to get to the answer to my que the question when I'll, I'm going to spend the rest of the time elaborating, but basically my argument in a nutshell is that it has to do with um, activism by women's rights organizations that took advantage of critical junctures after there was a change of leadership or some kind of social upheaval, they took advantage of these moments to assert their demands. And then the other part of the explanation has to do with uh, the ways in which the leaders in these countries used women's rights kind of in an instrumental way um, as an internal strategy to neutralize uh, extremist Islamist elements or movements. They also did it for the purpose of presenting a, a modernizing image of their countries to the world. So there, it had this internal and external objective. So that's, that's my argument in a nutshell, just so you know where I'm heading with this. Uh, very generally, and I know that, that um, most of you study this region, so it's, I'm, I don't want to go into any great detail here, but um, generally the, the Maghreb and the Middle East um, share many, much in common, um, even though I'm talking about the divergence today, but they share uh, hist common historical influences, um, colonial influences. Um, they share a similar um, language, Arabic, um, and, and um, they uh, have a dominant, um, they share the uh, uh, Islam religion. Um, they experienced the spread of uh, conservative Islam in recent decades. Um, and they also share with the Middle East um, some common cultural practices like uh, cousin marriage. But there's also, there are also some important uh, major differences. Uh, the Berber or the Amazir culture, as they refer to it, um, is something that is, is more specific to the, the Maghreb. Uh, so maybe a good place to start is what is in, what does the literature say about th these issues? And very, very generally, um, uh, there are uh, many of the existing explanations, at least in my field of political science, have to do with um, uh, uh, Islam. And, and one of the main explanations has come from uh, Ron Engelhardt and Pippa Norris, who have argued that it's, it's Islam and autocracy that work together to impede the progress in women's rights or, or to challenge progress. Uh, but what we see in these countries, these Mag Maghreb countries, is that you have um, co considerable re reform in women's rights. And so that requires more explanation than just saying, okay, we're writing it off and just saying, you know, it's, there's nothing here. Um, others like Jocelyn Cesari have argued that um, it's really religiously based legislation that contributes to the, to the lack of women's rights in Muslim countries. And in particular, kind of a hegemonic religion where there's the privileging of one religious group over others. Um, but again, one still has to explain why there's so much variance among Muslim countries, um, even not just in this region, but, but also elsewhere. And this is in part, you know, my, much of my interest in this question came from working in Sub-Saharan Africa where you had Muslim countries were some of the leaders in adopting women's rights. So it's not, it's too simplistic to say that it's just about the hegemonic religion. Um, Dawood Ahmed and Mohamed Buddha have also argued that um, the, the more, the, more the, the constitutions in Muslim majority countries, the more that they're Islamicized, the less they advance women's rights and the less democratic and politically stable they are. Um, others in my field have challenged this. Um, Daniel Adano and Bruce Russett say that it's not about autocracy, it's not about Islam, it's not about Arab culture. Um, rather, one has to look at the role of religious groups political actors, um, how secular the state is, the role of international and civil conflict. Um, and in my project, I'm trying to isolate some of these factors. 
Um, I draw heavily from the work of Munira Sharad, who has argued that the greater the autonomy of the state from kinship groups, um, the easier it was to adopt women's policies. And she worked in these three particular, these three same countries. Uh, um, so she's arguing that the more that the state is autonomous from society and especially from tribal groupings, the more you're going to see these reforms as was the case in Tunisia. But again, this may have explained the past, but it, it's something would have had to have changed in terms of the kinship group's relationship to the state to explain the changes we're seeing today. So, and again, this, this argument maybe goes so far, but it, it, it doesn't go far enough perhaps to explain what we're seeing now. And then finally, there's an argument by um, Dirce Engelke and Rania Maktabi, who have talked about the importance of unified legal systems, um, unified laws and unified courts um, in term, in, and their implications for reforming family law. And again, I think this is an important argument and it's one that I draw on, uh, but you have many countries outside the Maghreb, um, Iraq, Kuwait have unified laws, uh, and a unified court system. You have um, Libya, Yemen, Oman, and Egypt have unified courts, but not unified laws. And so you see some of this, these patterns, but um, it's, it, it, it perhaps is a necessary, but not sufficient condition for reform. So you have to have it, but it's not enough. There has to be something else. So again, I'm building on the unified legal system argument, but I think one needs to still go further. So before we, um, Let's see, sorry, not jumping around here. Um, it, it's perhaps um, important, even though I'm generalizing about the Maghreb countries, it's important to show that there are differences also between them. And they're, in fact, they're quite substantial differences. I think people often lump them together, but in fact, there are quite big historical differences that in fact, that affect the uh, women's rights uh, regimes. Uh, and so, in, in, the, in uh, Morocco, you have a monarchy uh, and uh, you have this king who, um, Mohammed Asadis, who, think, who sees himself as a modernizer, as somebody who promotes women's rights, human rights. Um, and he, he very much draws on the religious and cultural traditions to legitimate his rule. He sees himself, he's a, he, he and his, um, ancestors uh, were in he, uh, his father and so on before him were the commanders of the commander of the faithful. And uh, so he draws on religious symbolism um, to maintain a religious pluralism and to, to promote women's rights. In particular, he's used women's rights as part of a modernizing strategy to moderate the Salafi and the Islamist influences. And he's used his religious authority to do that. <laughs> um, and uh, so, and, and this, these use many different mechanisms. Um, some are constitutional mechanisms, but some are also repression of the Salafi inspired violence, uh, offering incentives to nonviolent Salafis, um, and then engaging in these reforms. Um, another influence, and we don't have much time to go into it, but it is that Morocco was never part of the Ottoman Empire. And so that has legal implications, um, you know, for the way that the law was. Um, family law was, was adjudicated. And also it, it was not part of the African Union until very recently. Um, it, it joined four years ago, rejoined. It had been, um, it had left over 30 years ago as a result of some of differences over a dispute over Western Sahara. But that also has implications because African Union put certain, has had certain goals and targets around women's rights, um, but that didn't affect Morocco for that time. Algeria uh, was colonized longer than the other two countries, 132 years um, compared to 40 years with the other two. And, um, and it has post, uh, post-war legacies, two post-war legacies. The first one um, after the War of Independence, and then the second one after the Black Decade uh, from 1991 to 2002. And um, I've written a book, an earlier book about the impact of conflict, especially after the 90s. Uh, and, and even more so after 2000 uh, in Africa and how countries that came out of conflict had um, higher rates of representation of women in parliament, they passed more legislation and so on. And so you see some of these post-war tendencies that you see in the rest of Africa, you see them in Algeria as well. Um, and then finally you have Tunisia, which uh, of the three countries is the only democracy, although it's, it's running into some difficulties these days, 
but it um, it had a much more uh, centralized state, as I said, I mentioned about Munira Sharad's work. And it has a much longer history of women's rights legislation. Uh, one of the first um, things that Gorgiba did was to re reform the uh, personal status code and improve women's uh, rights in the family. Uh, and also, um, that was, so that was in 1956, right from the get go. And he even did that before the reforming the constitution. 1959, they changed the constitution and they also increased um, various uh, women's rights provisions in that. So you can see that there's big differences within these, between these three countries. Um, having said that, now we're seeing this conver a convergence uh, and you can see it in this chart of, around women's rights provisions within the constitution that each country started with minimal provisions and gradually they've all adopted the same types of provisions in the constitution. Uh, the same thing has happened in the laws. You see um, initially the, with a personal status code, but then there's been a diffusion of, of um, if one country adopts one law, then the next year the other country will do the same. So you see that with sexual harassment law, nationality law, quota laws, quotas for women in the legislature, um, Violence Against Women Act, um, the abolition of the rape loophole, and, and so on. So you have this diffusion of, of influences uh, um, within the region. Uh, and this is not an act, sorry, this is not an accident. Sorry about that. This, my, my mouse is a little bit loose today. <laughs> um, so, uh, oops, am I going the wrong direction? All right. Um, if you look at kind of the, oh, here, this is one, another index or another way of measuring it. Um, the closer you are to um, one, the greater the discrimination. So here again, um, if you compare the, the, the light bar is the Middle East, the, the uh, darker bar is the average for the Maghreb countries. You can see differences in terms of family code. This, this, this measure is one that combines, I'm not very happy with it, but it combines um, law as well as outcomes. So it's, not just, it's also looking at the impact of the law, not simply the law. Um, so family code, um, you see the difference, physical activity, whether women can travel, um, for example, without permission from a spouse. Uh, restricted resources and assets is the only one area where you see similarity in terms of the um, percentage access to, to land or property or inheritance. Um, civil liberties, whether women can run for office and so on, and or rather to what extent are they succeeding in running for office. Um, and then because you see the overall difference. So this is quite a big, big gap um, between um, the two regions if you average out the, um, the, the, the index. Um, perhaps the biggest differences you see in the, in the political uh, arena. Uh, and here again, if you look, the orange line is the Maghreb, the blue line is the Middle East, and the, the gray line is the world. You can see that, um, the, the average percentage of women in the legislature is, is, is a quite a big divergence between the Maghreb and the, the Middle East. And if you look at the local level, you may even see bigger differences. Um, in Tunisia, for example, um, women make up a stunning 47% of the Tunisian uh, council positions after the 2018 election. Um, that's much higher than the rates in France or Britain or Germany, for example. Um, and the uh, Islamist Ennahda party um, had a, was elected their first woman mayor in tu Tunis. At the local level in Morocco also, 38% of the communal council seats are held by women. Um, that's, and that was after 2015, and that was three times as many as you had in 2009. Okay, so what then explains the differences? Um, when I talked to people, I mean, they came up with um, a lot of explanations and uh, I think some of them are useful to think about just in terms of they pr provide a background for the arguments that I'm going to make. They aren't they are I wouldn't call these my argument or my reasons, but they help they help explain some things. Um, and a lot of the explanations people gave me were cultural. Uh, so um, 
for example, they talked about the role of um, the influences of French socialism and French feminism on the women's movements in, in, uh, in these countries. As you know, there's a lot of back and forth among the political elite or the elite in general um, between France and North Africa. And so, and many studied in, in France uh, and elsewhere in Europe. But so there was this, this kind of influence. Uh, uh, the other, the other one that's talked about a lot, especially in Algeria and Morocco, was the influence of the rise of the Amazir dimension or factor dimension, as they call it, the Berber um, aspect. And this is it's it's not very tangible, but it's something that you you see a lot in the culture there. This is a statue of Dihia, who is a, you you might know her, her better as Kahina from in in Arabic, but. Um, Dihia in, in Berber or, or, or Tamazir um, was a um, is a uh, Amazir queen warrior who lived in the seventh century um, in an part of Algeria, and she was she could have some say she was Jewish, some say she was Christian, but anyway she was somebody who had twice beat back the Umayyad invaders in um, this eastern Algeria, western Tunisia area. And so today you see all kinds of books about her um, in the demonstrations they had for the last, you know, in 2019, 2020 in Algeria, you can see the middle, the middle um, picture, you can see her, her uh, picture of her. You have restaurants named after her, pizza parlors named after her, um, cosmetics, I mean, everything, storybooks, cartoons, every, she's very, very popular um, and in the imagination. And she's not the only one. Um, there's also um, Tin Hinan, the fourth century Tuareg queen uh, and warrior from the Hagar region in Algeria. Um, there was Zainab um, Nafzuya of the Almor um, Almoravids, um, which is a Berber dynasty that controlled the Maghreb and the, um, Al Andalus from 1040 to um, 1147 uh, CE. So, and there's many others. So it, but it, it gives you a sense that there's a sense of, um, it's, a, it's a secular movement. It's a movement that's um, pushing up against, especially Islamist extremism. Um, and uh, so, that, so that's, seen, that's seen as one aspect and, and it's, a, it's a culture that um, gives, elevates women, women as leaders in a, in a, in a particular way. Um, I also heard a lot about the Sufi, <laughs> um, Sufism and the importance of women. It's, it, women are cut out of many religious roles, but Sufism provides a certain, um, uh, gives them certain central roles in pre-Islamic rituals that are associated with healing and fertility um, and so it's, fair, and it's fairly strong in the Maghreb, um, Sufism, and women are given these leadership roles and, and uh, in mosques and zawiyas or the, the, the kind of religious monasteries. And so it's an area where women can assert their independence and sometimes challenge local patriarchal culture um, and escape from convention. But this is not my, <laughs> it's not my argument, but I just want to give this, these, are, these explanations there too, because they do infuse the, they are the cultural background and the landscape on which I'm talking about. Um, but I will hinge much more of my argument to, in terms of women's rights to um, pressures that from, from women's rights organizations. Uh, and um, in particular, I mean, there were several, there, been, there are many organizations today. And in fact, the numbers are increasing in a country like Tunisia um, quite dramatically, uh, but, you have this um, certain kind of inflection, certain moments that women have taken advantage of. Um, and uh, they've been able to, sorry, assert themselves. I'm sorry, I don't know why my mouse is just jumping like crazy today. <laughs> um, one of the most important early organizations, which helps explain the diffusion of these laws was the Collective Maghreb Egalité, um, 95 which um, was an association of women from these three countries that got together and they developed a plan of a hundred laws they wanted to change. And the laws that you're seeing today, they are the ones that they outlined. It's, it's, it, they have this playbook and it's, it's amazing to what extent they've actually been able to accomplish the, the, the goals that they set for themselves and, um, and made the changes that they, uh, they, they targeted. Um, so it's a, so that this in part explains 
you know, the collaboration between these groups explains why you have the, the, the synchronicity of these, these legislative reform. Um, as one Tunisian lawyer and women's rights activist explained, I currently participate in many meetings on law. Um, and when you attend these meetings, you realize the rapprochement between the Maghreb countries and the legal difference between the Maghreb and the Middle East. First, the feminist movement appeared almost simultaneously in all three countries. For example, we conducted many meetings together on sexual harassment, and the three states at the same time changed laws to punish sexual harassment. When we established parity in our electoral law in 2011, in Algeria, they modified the constitution and modified the electoral law to introduce the quota. Morocco introduced parity in the constitution and laws, and so it's moving forward in a convergent way. So, um, so there you see one piece of the explanation. Uh, and again, they took advantage of key moments and I could go through many of them, but you know, one would have been in Algeria would have been the end of, I mean, sorry, in Tunisia would have been the end of Ben Ali's rule uh, in, and the Arab Spring 2011, um, and after which they really made big push to get changes to, to preserve uh, and make changes in the constitution, to preserve their rights and make changes. In Algeria, the push came after the end of the black decade, a very, very brutal war in which, um, which left uh, many people dead and, and disappeared. Uh, and women suffered very, very, um, you know, very horrifically in, in, in that period, um, a conflict between the Islamists and the extremists and the government. And then the um, 20th of February movement in, in Morocco, which was kind of their mini Arab Spring. Again, you saw after that changes in the constitution, which um, affected women and, and al -Mazir. Um in, the, in my book, I talk about um, to, to understand why women's rights have been so central in, in the region and to major developments in the region. I argue that one has to not just look at the events that took place, but also look at the symbolic dimension of politics, um, something that's not done very much in my, at least in political science. Uh, and women's rights in many ways have become a proxy for attitudes towards progress, modernity, secularism, nationalism, and democracy. And women and women's bodies often represent uh, attitudes towards sexuality and morality and religious devotion. Uh, and so in the region, you see many debates going on over how women are dressed. Um, uh, and you, know, you have the state regulating in all three countries, regulating what women wear. They, they uh, banned the niqab in all three countries, or at least the sale of the niqab in, in the case of Morocco. Uh, it's seen as something extremist and foreign. Um, so, you know, women are very much at the center of all these, of all these um, battles that are going on. Um, and it's also, you know, one of the things that I was always curious about was that, so if you go to like a, a lecture on women's rights, I, I was teaching at the Al Hawaiian University in Morocco for a year, and they, you know, the women's rights are, are, you know, you almost will have more men at an event than women, um, if you're talking about women's rights. And I was always curious about why, but it's because it, you know, it is this proxy, it represents so much more than just, it's not just about women, it's about all these other you know, about modernity and about nationalism and secularism and all these other concerns. So this, this comes up a lot in society, daily life. Um, just to give one or two examples, um, there was a woman in Algiers who was um, in 2018, who was verbally assaulted and beaten for jogging on the beach during Ramadan. And when she went to the police to complain, they asked um, why was she dog jogging and they blamed her and, and they did nothing and just told her to go home. So then she took it to the social media <laughs> and the next day, hundreds of women and men and some NGOs, they all came out to run alongside her. Um, so you have these, you know, these kinds of everyday forms of resistance. Um, you also have other, um, other moments. Um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, um, the state itself has, has, has in, in all these three countries, has used a variety of tactics to, to try to uh, repress extremism. And uh, they've used repression, they've used co-optation, they've used surveillance, and they've used various kinds of accommodation to neutralize extremists. Um, but the use of women and women's rights and women's bodies is also one of these 
um, as, as they've used them as a moderating force. And so, and this has had both problematic but beneficial consequences for women and, and women's rights and, and women's rights activists. So for one example here, again, we draw on the symbolic politics, but there was a man who placed, you can see him in the picture there, who placed um, a Daesh flag on top of the University of Manuba. Um, and in response, um, this 25 year old woman student um, climbed up onto the top of the university building and took the flag down and then put the Tunisian flag up. Again, drawing um, national attention to her act of defiance. Uh, she was later then um, honored in a ceremony by the Minister of Interior, um, who was of the Islamist Ennahda party. Uh, and he called her a symbol of Tunisian women, <laughs> and praising her patriotism and suggesting that the Salafi flag represented a foreign influence that was external or the, the Daesh flag represented an external influence, a foreign influence that was um, from outside of Tunisia. So again, you have the symbolic politics and the politics of nationalism being tied to uh, women. So, um, so leaders, so one of the biggest differences then between the Mag most Maghreb, well, the Maghreb countries and most Middle East countries, I think Egypt is kind of a, we'll have to talk about that because it's a little bit of a, an exception here, but I don't, but I st still think what I'm arguing holds. Um, one of the biggest differences is that these Maghreb leaders use women's rights as a strategy to neutralize extremist Islamist movements. Um, and they then at the same time were signaling to the West that you know, they have this modernizing image and so on. Um, <laughs> it's very weird. Um, and so they, they um, how am I doing for time? I can't see the... You're okay, you're okay, okay. Karen. Yeah. All right, good. Um, so, for example, um, they, you know, they, these, a lot of the Islamist parties, you have Islamist parties in, in power in Morocco and Tunisia, they, they, um, they realized very quickly that if they were going to have staying power, they would have to make concessions in this area. And perhaps they were defensive, but they have now adopted the language of women's rights through a process of what um, El, -Hashi, El Hashimi is called political learning. So the, the party, the PJD, the Party of Justice and Development in Morocco, came to power in 2011, and it has made a almost 180 degree <laughs> turnaround from um, its opposition to, for example, the, the reforms of the personal status code that were made in 2004. In fact, they had led demonstrations against the, the reforms in the code, family code. They had issued fatwas against <laughs> women who were in the, the activists who were promoting these reforms. Um, but when they became then headed up the coalition government, um, they changed their position. Um, and it's, grad it's changed gradually, it didn't happen just overnight, but, it's, but since 2011, you see this, 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 this uh, change. They were very much against, for example, the convention on the elimination um, of discrimination of women, CEDAW. And today they're basically supported, um, at least verbally. <laughs> um, they support the personal status code um, and they've continued with their with the reforms. So they didn't just, they, in fact, they went further than Istiklal, the more secular party. They've, uh, when, when Istiklal was head of the, the coalition, it made very few reforms around women's rights, but um, under PJD, they continued with the electoral law reforms that introduced quotas. They made, uh, it introduced anti-trafficking law, Violence Against Women Act. They're considering abortion legislation. I don't know how far that will go. Um, they've in included protections for domestic workers. Um, they've in adopted two European Union funded programs um, that are quite major in terms of women's policy reforms. So again, a huge, huge shift uh, in terms of um, how they see uh, women's rights. Now, what they mean by all of this, we, we can discuss. It's not perhaps that, you know, they have, may have very different understandings than maybe the, some of the secular feminists do. I, I know they do, but, um, you know, it is, it is a change. Um, same thing with Enahda, you saw, especially in the debates over the constitutional reforms when the constitution was um, uh, being amended in, or rewritten in 2014, you saw 
big debates over, uh, especially over, I mean, there are many different clauses, but one in particular had to do with the uh, com complementarity clause. And uh, they wanted to introduce this clause that would more or less suggest that women are competent in their home sphere and men in the public sphere. And um, there was also language that talked about, you know, that Tunisia is part of a sacred country, or laws are sacred. And there was a worry that that might introduce a religious element that would then push back and undo some of the laws like the personal status code that had been in effect. And so um, they were the the activists, women's rights activists, were able to to keep those um, clauses from entering in to the constitution, and they were able to um, they ended up with one of the, one of the most progressive constitutions in the world um, for women. Uh, Bouteflika also in Algeria um, before he was thrown out of power, he also um, has use women's rights as part of an act, a, a, a means of isolating um, and neutralizing Islamist extremists um, and promoting women as leaders. Now, the current president just hasn't been visible. He's had COVID for the much of the time he's been in power, so it's hard to evaluate what happened after him, but at least that was the, the policy up until um, Bouteflika left office um, a, a year and a half ago. So, in a nutshell, um, what we've seen, what I will argue is that the reason for this different divergence between the Maghreb and the Middle East is um, that there has been a political will of the leaders to neutralize Islamist extremist movements, not, not Islamist movements, but extremist movements by promoting women's rights. Um, and another piece of this is not such a big piece, but another piece of it is also to signal to the international community that they are you know, moving toward, they're modern, they're progressive and so on. Um, and a lot of it has come from parties recognizing that their political survival <laughs> was at stake here and that they had to, they would have to make these accommodations um, in part, um, yeah, for, for international consumption, but also in, for internal, um, internal reasons. And then, um, and then, this wouldn't have happened without pressure from activists. I mean, you need actors to make these things happen. And so the, these women's activists took advantage of critical junctures to push for these changes. Uh, I would like to just end with a cautionary note um, about autocrats adopting women's rights. Um, policies in which women's rights are instrumental to other purposes um, may mark symbolic advances but they also can run the risk of not addressing women's rights concerns. They can also have problematic unintended consequences um, of not, for example, including women uh, representatives in the crafting of policies or of not, of not being developed with the interests of women themselves in mind if they're being used for some other objective. Um, sometimes they're used to divert attention from other human rights violations and then they can work at cross purposes uh, to women's rights, which are contingent on freedom of association, um, freedom of speech and free and fair elections and the right to pr freely participate in politics. Um, policies which are enacted for purposes of expediency and of pleasing an external audience may look good on paper, but then they may not be implemented. And in fact, that's one of the biggest concerns is that very often there's nice policies, but there's no funding for them and they're not um, carried out because they're, you know, the people are not serious about really seeing them through always. Um, and then finally, um, as happened in the case of women who were associated with Ben Ali's regime in Tunisia, women's rights activists who are sometimes associated with autocrats in this way, um, even if they themselves are sincere in their goals, they may find themselves tainted by association with a corrupt and dictatorial government. Um, especially once a, a country democratizes. So um, I will leave it at that. And thank you very much for listening. And I, I look forward to your comments and questions.